sorry for just a few minutes late getting started. One of our speakers has been held up and we thought we were just giving a few minutes, but I think really we should get started. We have to be out of the hall at 9 o'clock, so um, everybody got to get nice and early, so I don't want to close everyone up. Um, so I'm in Wendy MacDonald um, from the Scottish Socialist Party and I'll be chairing the meeting this evening. Um, tonight's meeting, Socialist Days of Independence, is one of dozens of meetings just like this that the Scottish Socialist Party have held throughout Scotland in the run up to the referendum. Uh, these main meetings have taken their unique message for independent socialist Scotland to communities right across uh, Scotland. Tonight we have three, well hopefully three excellent speakers, we have a very list of two excellent speakers, um, Sandra Webster who we hope will be joining us shortly, Colin Fox and Dennis Canavan. Um, tonight we'll hear for each, from each of our speakers for 10 to 15 minutes before I invite questions from the floor. <coughs> so whilst um, we're here to listen to you people on the panel, we also want to hear from you guys your questions and uh, have the panel responding to them. So why are we all here? In two very short weeks' time, the polls will open in probably one of the most important votes that Scotland has faced in 300 years. The whole country has been energised by the debate around the referendum, and that's an immense credit to the Yes Scotland campaign. It's the biggest grassroots political campaign this, this country's seen in the past 25 years, probably since the, the equally successful anti poll tax campaign. The debate has managed to turn political red picking questions into grassroots action, um, particularly amongst working class communities in Scotland, and these communities have really been the backbone of the Yes campaign. Um, the campaign for a fairer welfare Scotland, where Scotland, the Scottish people make decisions that affect them in their everyday lives. The Yes Scotland coalition is made up of a number of parties, the Green Party, the SNP, SSP, in addition to this formal coalition, there's a huge number of other pro-independence um, campaigning groups, including Women for Independence, Carers for Independence, and probably a myriad of others that you've heard as well. Contrary to what the, new, the, the, the No campaign would like you to believe, Yes Scotland's not only about the SNP. Yes, they've set out a white paper, and that's the SNP's mandate for what they think an independent Scotland would look like. But there are many other offerings, including the SSP's socialist case, case for Socialist Independent Scotland. Um, and that pamphlet is, is available at the back of the hall, um, just here. Very recently, in fact last week, I tried to make that very point to the Labour MP Jim Murphy, just in the steel yard along the road, um, when I challenged him when he stood and said to the people of Badgate that it's all about the SNP, and a vote for yes is a vote for Alex Salmond. And when I challenged him, him, his response to me was, um, I don't think you really understand what I'm saying. I can see that you're busy with your wains and picking them up from the school. Um, well, Mr. Murphy, um, I wasn't too happy about that, you can imagine. Um, I do understand the issues and I have done my own research. And despite being a single working mother, and yeah, having to deal with the washing, the work and the wains, um, I have decided to vote yes. But that's based on my values, my values of social justice, equality and fairness. And I think that really it's the, to the disgrace of um, Scotland and the Westminster government of persistent and increasing inequality that our communities are faced with in Scotland. And it certainly took a, long, a lot longer than two and a half minutes over a cup of tea to come to that. <laughs> from that exchange feeling really quite patronised and disrespected and I really hope that everybody walks out of this hall tonight feeling respected and feeling that, that, that really they've been given the respect that every single citizen in this community is due to them. At that point I should be welcoming a strong female voice in this campaign but unfortunately she's probably stuck on the M8. Um, so at this point, because you're not here to hear me speak, although I'm sure I can speak um, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, our first speaker, um, who is Colin Fox. Um, Colin represents the Scottish Socialist Party on the Yes Scotland Advisory Board and has campaigned tirelessly for an independent socialist Scotland. Colin is also Scotland's longest serving party leader, hey. Martin Esmer, um, <laughs> I was that last time. Um, and I think he's one of the rare political creatures who prefers straight talking over spin. Um, 
is not a country. Britain is not a country. Britain is the rare thing in the world today. It's a political union of four countries, at least four countries. Scotland, on the other hand, we are a country. We are not a region or a province of anywhere else. We are a country, we are a nation. And we are entitled to our self-determination in exactly the same way as 280 other free independent countries in the world take for granted. And I have to say to you, sometimes profound things that are struck, you're struck by, you don't realise how much has actually changed. And the psychology and the thinking of working people in Scotland. I grew up in Motherwell. It's no far from Barkey. I grew up in Motherwell. And when I grew up in Motherwell, my grandpa Fox and my grandpa Markin worked with British Steel Corporation. People in Motherwell went to their work on British rail trains. If you had a telephone, we had a party line. Do you remember party line? <laughs> we had a party line. Oh, when they watch your party, listen to your neighbour talking. Why are you waiting to go on the phone to your girlfriend? <coughs> the night. Anyway, we had a party line, but that's not important right now. What's important is, it was British Telecom who put in your phone. British Telecom, British Steel, British Rail. My mum worked for the National Health Service. She worked in law hospital can look, it was the British National Health Service. People in Motherwell voted for the British Labour Party. In fact, the only people in Motherwell who didn't vote Labour voted Communist. But you voted British, you're British. The British Trade Unions had 13 million members. That was the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s. Go and we have the census of 2011. And 81% of people in Scotland described themselves as Scottish, <coughs> not British. And that's a remarkable turnaround as far as the events of the last few years are concerned. And that's why we're in the circumstances we're in today. Scotland is a nation, and we're looking for our independence on the 18th of September. And the other thing that we've learned is, of course, that supporting Scotland's right to self-determination doesn't make you a Scottish nationalist. Supporting a country's democratic right to self-determination makes you a democrat. And, of course, that's why Millions of people across Scotland standing as Democrats, as the Scottish Socialist Party does. We stand in the traditions of John McLean, James Connolly, the leader of the Red Five Siders a hundred years ago, who supported Scotland's democratic right to make its own decisions because working class people were going to be better off as a consequence. We've learned all that. And we've learned in the course of the last two years that working class people in Scotland will be economically better off, socially better off, politically better off with independence. And why can we say that? Because Scotland is a wealthy country. Scotland is a wealthy country. We've learned in the course of this debate that the OECD, the Economist, the Financial Times, and others have pointed out that an independent Scotland with control of its own industry and resources and reserves would be the 14th richest country in the world. We would be richer, measured in GDP per head of population, than France is today. We would be richer than Japan is today. We would be richer than Italy is today. Or Spain is today. An independent Scotland, and why would we be better off? Why would we be one of the richest countries in the world? Because the rich countries in the world, what's unique about them is they have a diverse array of industries and wealth creating sources. And Scotland is like that. Yes, we've got oil and gas. We've got financial services. We've got life sciences, information technology. Renewable energy, one of the few countries in the world, a third of our electricity is already supplied by renewable sources. And we are moving towards 100% in due course. We've got universities, world-class universities. We've got whiskey industry, food and drink industry. You know they talk about the, the new emerging BRIC economies of Brazil, Russia, India and China. You know the talking economists are talking that 20% century will belong to these countries and the way that the 20th century belonged to America. And one of the things those four countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, have in common, many things, but one of them is they have an insatiable desire, an insatiable thirst for Scotch whiskey. There's a billion Chinese who can't get enough of it. There's a billion Indians who like Scotch whiskey, Brazilians and Russians. And of course, the whiskey industry, food and drink industry, smoked salmon, Aberdeen Angus, these are very profitable. But I'm bound to say this to you as a socialist, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Our most precious resource is not the oil in the North Sea. It is not the whiskey in Isla or the Mori space age. Our most precious resource is you. The 5.2 million people who live here, who have shown repeatedly 
We're talented, clever, resourceful, enterprising, put challenges in front of us and we'll solve them. We should be confident in our abilities to run our own affairs. A damn sight more confident than those who try and run them on our behalf and make an arse of it if you'll pardon the French. So we are confident that an independent Scotland will be economically better off richer. And it stands to reason when you think about it, this comes close to home. If you think about it, all the income tax that you pay, all the VAT you pay, all the duty you pay in alcohol, tobacco, petrol, all the corporation tax, capital gains tax, VAT, etc. For all those taxes, duties and levies that take so much of your wages away, which to stay here in Scotland instead of being siphoned off by the UK Treasury, stands to reason we're better off. And the issue for me is not that we'll be wealthier, it's that we are then able to do things with that wealth that we've long wanted to do. You know, in Glasgow, one in three children today in Glasgow are living in poverty, grown up in poverty. What does that mean? That means that there are children in Glasgow who don't have a proper pair of shoes for the winter. They wear the same trainers in December that they will wear in July. One in three kids, they don't get to go on those school trips. One in three kids are not properly nourished. One in three kids are living in dark accommodation. One in three kids who by the age of five, their life's destiny is plotted out for them. We've got to break that circle. We are appalled by it. And we are determined in Scotland that these are the kind of things we want to eradicate in an independent Scotland. The child poverty, the pensioners poverty, the fuel poverty that sees one in three families in West Lothian who don't have enough money to pay gas and electric bills now because they've doubled the price and all the cuts that are there. These are the things we want to eradicate with independence. This is what this debate's about. And independence gives us the opportunity to do it. Eradicate the food banks. The equivalent of the 1930 soup kitchens. Alive and unwell, I'm sorry to say, in communities like yours today. We've got to eradicate all that. We've got to eradicate the low pay, the scourge of low pay that sees 860,000 Scots paid on and around the national minimum wage. These are the issues, the scandals, the scourges that we intend to address with independence when we achieve it in two weeks' time. And of course, the other thing we can say about independence is it's politically better off for working class people because with independence, we can guarantee, I'm in Princess Street today, on the megaphone, sometimes I might meet you, I'm there two or three times a week, on the Princess Street megaphone and say, come and sign the petition for independence, Someone come and sign the declaration for independence, and send your own message to David Cameron, that after the 18th of September, there will not be any more David Camerons in Scotland. There will not be any more Tory governments that we didn't elect. There will not be any more bedroom tax that we didn't vote for. No more coal tax we didn't vote for. No more trident nuclear weapons based in our soil that we don't want to be there. No more laddies from West Lothian being killed in illegal wars abroad that we didn't support in the first place. Those days are over. That's what independence means. It means that the values, the social democratic and socialist values that we hold dear, that are the centre of our politics, at long last they're implemented, we're no longer at the victim or mercy of neoliberal, dog-eat-dog, devil-take-the-hindmost policies that come out of Whitehall, Westminster and the City of London. And that's an absolutely remarkable place to be. And yet it's two weeks tomorrow, and I think it's a fantastic time to be alive and consider that these are within our grasp. And I wanted to say just in my last remarks, um, Wendy, you know the no campaign, I was, I, I, quit, I was doing a meeting, I think Michael Dennis the other day, I think you might have heard this. <laughs> but at the debate, you had Alex Sarmond and Alistair Darling on the telly, remember, I mean, past Monday, you probably remember. And I remember a couple of days before it saying to people, look, I can give you an exclusive, the real leader of Better Together is going to come on the telly. No, Alistair Darling, the real leader. And the real leader of the No campaign is Private Fraser for Dad's army. <laughs> it's John Laurie who comes out. We're doomed, Captain Manley, we're doomed. Our oil's about to run out, it's no worth the promise. Our currency's no use, our pensions will never be paid. The sun will never shine again, Captain Manley, if you vote yes on the 18th of September. And you listen to me go, go on, almighty. It's just doom, 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 right? And they'll say, Dennis, Colin, really? You should be voting no because Scotland is the best of all worlds. This is as good as it gets. You'll never get better than this, Dennis. Scotland's got a strong Scottish Parliament there, all of it, and vital influence in Westminster. Who could want anywhere than that? That's better than winning the lottery. And Dennis and 
I sat together in the Scottish Parliament, and I can tell you, my daily experience was to get that number 31 bus to the Scottish Parliament every day for four years, and to be told by the presiding officer, hey Colin, you can't talk about unemployment in here. Who tells you you can talk about the national minimum wage in here? See the anti-trade union laws, you can't mention that in here. The quality for women, no, you can't talk about that in here. Who tells you you can talk about the war in Iraq, Trident, Afghanistan? You must have the right parliament. This is for the big boys and girls at Westminster. You just keep playing with your toys in the back there, the Dennis. We don't have a strong Scottish parliament. That's what this debate's all about. My constituents, sure Dennis did the same thing. They come and they see you for help with their welfare, with their, you know, and wages, with the conditions that they're in. And you see, I can't do anything about that. The Scottish Parliament's still good that far. You have to go away and see somebody else. And they're crestfallen, quite rightly too. So we don't have a Scottish Parliament that's got vital powers. And neither do we have vital influence in Westminster, because if we did hands up here, everybody who thinks that we'd have the bedroom tax today in Scotland if they listened to what we said. Yeah, hands up anybody who thinks that there'd been the privatisation of the Royal Mail if they listened to anything that we said. Hands up anybody who thinks we'd have a second generation trying nuclear weapons, spaced outside Glasgow, £100 billion. Pounds. We didn't want it, what did they do? It's there. We don't have vital influence at Westminster. They don't give a damn about us. They don't give a damn about our values. They carry on regardless, and that's what's brought us to this position. That's why this debate is really important. And I wanted to finish by saying, you know, for me, this debate, the Scottish Socialist Party, is a vision of Scotland after the 18th of September. The kind of independent Scotland I want to see is an independent socialist Scotland where nobody is left behind. Where the power is in the people of Scotland and not faceless, anonymous corporations and bureaucrats. They're never elected, you never see them, they're never called to account but they've got all the money. We want to see a Scotland that's a modern democratic republic where the head of state is elected, is accountable, is representative of the people we purport to serve. Not a feudal relic. The divine right of kings, hereditary privileges, that we put with the ark centuries ago. We're a modern democratic country. We want to be a country that's at peace with ourselves and peace with the rest of the world. That's the kind of Scotland I believe the overall majority of people in West Lothian and Edinburgh and Glasgow, Motherwell, Fort William, the whole country wants to see. And frankly, that's what we're constructing in the Yes campaign, as far as I'm concerned. So I'll leave you with these words, the 18th of September, vote yes, of course. Next two weeks, help us as much as you can, persuade your family, your friends, your workmates, your colleagues, fellow students, that they should vote yes too. And above all, on the 19th of September, promise yourself that when you wake up and Scotland has voted for independence, you can turn to your wife, your husband, your partner, your son, your daughter, your colleagues at work and say, I did that. I did that. I changed the world forever. Thank you. Uh, that uh, an independent 
in Scotland would be uh, a better Scotland. Now, I myself am a convert uh, to the cause uh, of independence, and I, I would like to begin by telling you uh, something of the political journey which I undertook and which brought me to this particular destination. I was uh, uh, from a Labour uh, background. Uh, uh, I was virtually born and brought up in the Labour Party. My late grandfather was one of the founding members of the first branch of the Labour Party in the county of Fife. That was a way back at the turn of the 19th and uh, 20th century. Grandad wasn't born in Scotland, he was actually born in Ireland, but he came here at the age of four, the youngest uh, of a family of 11. They were, I suppose, what nowadays we would call economic migrants. Uh, they were looking for work, and at that time, in the coal fields of West Fife, there were job uh, opportunities. Uh, and it's worthwhile recalling what was it that these pioneers, socialist pioneers, yes, there were socialists in the Labour Party at that time, <laughs> socialists who founded the Labour Party, what, what was it that these socialist pioneers uh, were fighting for? They were campaigning for basic things like the right to work, the right to a decent living, the right to a roof over your head, the right to educational opportunity, especially for your children and the right to a free health service available to all at the time of need. Uh, and uh, what was it that drove them? It was uh, a hunger, sometimes real hunger, a fire in the belly hunger, but always it was a, a hunger for social justice. And it is that same hunger for social justice which is the driving force behind many people in the Yes Scotland a campaign uh, today. Because when we look around our country at this particular time, then there is a distinct uh, lack of social justice. Child poverty. Uh, one in four children at least is suffering from child poverty in Scotland. Over 70,000 people are dependent uh, upon uh, food banks. Uh, and of course, uh, we have got uh, this iniquitous bedroom tax which is causing misery <coughs> to thousands of people uh, in our country. Uh, indeed, if we look at the UK as a whole, the statistics indicate that we are the fourth, the fourth most unequal society in the whole of the developed world. And yet the better together people tell us that we're, well, better together. <laughs> Do you believe them? Well, I wonder sometimes what kind of world uh, they're living in. Now, I used to think that the solution to all this social injustice was the return of a Labour government at Westminster committed to socialist policies. Indeed, I remember a general election way back when I was a young Labour candidate, uh, I think it was the 1979 uh, general election, and we put to the people a choice. We said, at this important general election, you face a choice. What kind of society do you want? Do you want a greedy, grasping, ruthless, selfish rat race? Where only the strongest survive and the weakest go to the wall? Or do you want a caring, sharing society? Where look, people look after their neighbour and most help goes to those who are most in need? Well, at that general election, Scotland as a whole uh, voted for the caring, sharing society. But we were outnumbered and outvoted by other voters elsewhere in the United Kingdom. And what kind of society did we get? We got a Prime Minister who had the brass neck to come up and tell the kick that there's no such thing <laughs> as society. And of course the rest is history with all the mass unemployment, the deindustrialization that place in Scotland, the social and economic havoc, the absolute uh, devastation uh, which, which is still making a lot of communities in Scotland uh, suffer uh, to this day. Well, history has a, a knack of repeating itself and uh, you know, he, he, here we are again, uh, we have yet again a situation whereby Scotland is being ruled uh, by a government which 
which the people of Scotland did not elect. Uh, we are being ruled by a Tory-led coalition, and the elite party in that coalition has got the magnificent total of one, one out of 59 Scottish parliamentary constituencies at Westminster. And yet that one seat is sufficient under the British Constitution to give them a mandate to foist upon us policies <coughs> which we did not vote for and policies uh, which we do not want. And that Tory-led coalition is, as you know, rewarding the rich with massive tax handouts, punishing the poor with savage cuts in their benefits. So it's little wonder that people are, are crying out for change. But if we look at the Westminster setup, uh, what changes on offer there? None, obviously, from the coalition. They are all bent and continuing uh, on their present course of action. But what about the opposition? Sometimes I turn on the box and I look uh, not just at the government side of the House of Commons, but I look at the green benches on the other side, uh, the benches which I occupied for most of the time that I was there. And what do I see? I see this guy, Ed Miliband, who is the leader of the party which my grandfather helped to found, and I see little, if any, socialist commitment there. It took him over a year to come out with a rather half-hearted and forced commitment to abolish uh, the bedroom tax. He's still intent on continuing with the benefit cap, which was introduced by the Tory government. In fact, he's going one, one better or one, one worse, he says publicly announced that he is going to have further cuts uh, in the benefits for young people aged from 16 to 18 who have been deprived of the right to work. Uh, so all that he's offering is another brand of austerity and if he says he can't afford otherwise, then it isn't it interesting the plan to spend over a hundred billion pounds on the replacement of Trident nuclear weapon, a weapon of mass destruction. So that's his expenditure priorities. So changing the occupancy of 10 Downing Street, in other words, is not going to bring about the radical change which the people of Scotland uh, want to see. So I have no faith in the constitutional status quo. I don't see independence as some kind of panacea but I do think it offers a massive opportunity for people of my age group, a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring about the type of change which the majority of the people of Scotland uh, want to see. As I said previously, I'm a convert uh, to the cause of uh, independence and my conversion is not based on any great emotional experience is based mainly on my lifetime experience, uh, particularly my parliamentary experience. Uh, I spent 26 years, some people might say I misspent 26 years as a member of parliament at Westminster, uh, followed by eight years as an independent member uh, of the Scottish parliament. I've been retired now for uh, seven years, and as some of you may know, retirement uh, gives you Time to think, time to reflect, and after a great deal of thinking and reflection, I have come to the conclusion that Westminster is completely out of touch with the people of Scotland. What about the Scottish Parliament? Well, it's not perfect, it's made up of human beings, and of the very nature of things, human beings sometimes make mistakes. And as I say, the Scottish Parliament is not perfect, but by and large, I think over the past 15 years, the Scottish Parliament has shown by its track record that it has responded far more positively and far more readily to the needs, the wishes, and the aspirations of the people of Scotland. And let me just give a few, <laughs> let me give a few examples uh, just to justify uh, that statement. Uh, students in Scotland who go on to university don't pay uh, tuition fees, uh, the tuition fees which were introduced by Westminster. By the way, a lot of people think it is manufacture 
Mm -hmm. the, 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 nothing was stopped. Mm -hmm. It was it was the Blair government. I remember we had to wait on 18 long years of opposition when the people were crying out for a Labour government that would at least make something a bit better. Things can only get better was the, the, the theme tune as I, I recall it. Uh, and uh, you know one of the first bills that Blair introduced, now he mentioned in the manifesto by the way, uh, one of the first bills he introduced was a bill to introduce tuition fees and also to abolish student grants even for students from low income families. People like my grandfather and his uh, fellow councillors way back in the 1920s, they must be burning in their graves because they saw education as the key to the liberation of the working class and they introduced Grants to enable working class children to stay on in school, beyond the school statutory leaving age. And in some cases, all too few at that time uh, to go on to college or university. And by the time I went to university in the 1960s, Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister, and we had the most generous student support system in the whole world. Uh, and we thought, naively perhaps, that this would uh, continue. Uh, indeed, I remember, I remember uh, 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 a young socialist revolutionary. No, he was a socialist. Would be too right wing a word for this guy at that particular time in his career. He was a communist revolutionary, and he was going around still in university. This must have been in the 1970s when I was a young Labour MP representing uh, the constituency. Uh, and uh, this guy was going around saying that uh, um, the students should start a revolution uh, because Harold Wilson wasn't increasing the student grant by at least the rate of inflation. Inflation was running to be 25%. <laughs> <laughs> it was another ridiculous, unrealistic uh, demand. And yet, fast forward, what, 15, 20 years, this erstwhile young revolutionary becomes a Labour, a right-wing Labour cabinet minister, and he, like all the rest of them, votes to abolish student grants uh, completely. I felt ashamed. By the way, the student revolutionary was a guy who now goes by the name of Lord John Reed of <laughs> uh, But you're right, Gordon, Gordon was of a similar ilk. Uh, revolutionary uh, Lord. Uh, yes, I remember. <laughs> And uh, there were others. I mean, the David Blunkett, who became the Secretary of State for Education. You can't blame Blair completely because he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. You know, he, his mum and dad had helped his crib and save to, to get him into the poshest uh, fee paying school in Edinburgh uh, and then go on to, to Oxbridge. I mean, they didn't have to make any great sacrifices, but people like uh, Gordon Brown and John Reed and David Blunkett, they should have told Blair where he was uh, going wrong, but they didn't. They kept silent, they just uh, voted in the cabinet, and then when the vote came to parliament, a few people uh, like myself uh, voiced uh, opposition to it uh, and voted against it. And uh, they tried to take revenge on me, they by the tribe of me of the right to be a Labour candidate for the Scottish Parliament. Uh, so I stood as an independent, and I got the biggest majority in Scotland. So I felt. <laughs> Thanks to 
the Scottish Parliament that students in Scotland get a fairer deal. Similarly, people in my age group, senior citizens, get a fairer deal in Scotland, yes. uh, thanks to the Sutherland Report, which was fully implemented in Scotland, but not south of the border, because people, old people in the community who require uh, care, uh, the nursing element of that care package and the personal care element of that care package is free of charge uh, in Scotland, whereas uh, down south people have to to uh, pay for it. I can uh, also think uh, of uh, uh, our National Health Service. I said previously that uh, we should have a National Health Service, health service that is freely available to the people uh, at the time of need. Uh, and it is still in Scotland the property of the people and it is still freely available at the time of need, uh, whereas south of the border uh, people are having to pay uh, <coughs> over £8 per item uh, in prescription charges. Um, and you know, I, I'm appalled when I hear uh, some of the present Labour leaders, including the existing leader of the so-called Scottish Labour Party, complaining that this is all a trick by that dreadful man Alex Salmond uh, to give the people something for nothing. Mm -hmm. Getting back to this party much something for nothing. And, uh, Sam is just trying to, to bribe the people who say this to get them to vote yes in this referendum uh, under false pretenses. Uh, you know, the sweetest, I mean, does she have a clue? I mean, is the National Health Service, is a free health service just a sweetie? Is a free education just a sweetie? I mean, these were. The National Free Education and the Free Health Service were two of the great pillars on which the Labour Party was founded and people like Keir Hardy and Nye Bevan must be burning in their graves uh, when they hear that kind of language uh, being used uh, by Scottish uh, Labour uh, leaders. So, the Scottish Parliament, as I was saying, has done some good things. It has brought about, to my mind, higher standards of social justice in many areas uh, compared with what our counterparts experience uh, south of the border. But the powers of the Scottish Parliament at present are very, very limited. Most of the big political decisions, and certainly most of the big economic decisions, are taken uh, at Westminster. <coughs> and even in the devolved areas, the areas that are at present the responsibility of the Scottish <coughs> Parliament, there is a limit to what we can deliver. I said previously, for example, that we are very proud that in Scotland we still have a National Health Service which is publicly owned and which is freely available at the, the time of need. However, how long can that continue as long as we have a situation whereby at present, under the existing arrangements, the Scottish Parliament is dependent for virtually every penny it spends, it is dependent on the vote of another Parliament, namely the Parliament at Westminster. Uh, and this block grant which we get back, in the country, which is just part of the taxes that we are paying anyway, part, not the whole, but part of the taxes that we, stay, we, we are paying, and this block grant uh, is determined by what's called the Barnett formula. Now, I'd like to just explain a wee bit on this because some of our opponents are now alleging that we are scaremongering or even telling lies uh, about the National Health Service in Scotland being under some kind of threat. And I hear Labour politicians like Gordon Brown and Alistair Darling accusing people like Colin and myself uh, of telling uh, downright thundering lies that there's no threat to the National Health Service at all. And yet, it's very strange because the Labour so-called comrades uh, in England and Wales, like Andy Burman, who's the Shadow Secretary of State for Health in England, uh, and his Welsh counterpart, the Minister for Wales, uh, in the National Assembly of Wales, uh, they have indicated that the National Health Service is on the edge of a cliff because of the privatisation 
uh, agenda which is emanating uh, from Westminster. And you don't have to be a brilliant economist to work out that this is inevitably going to have an effect on the National Health Service in Scotland if this trend uh, continues. Because why is it that these people at Westminster want privatisation? Two reasons. First of all, they want to hand out uh, rewards to their rich friends uh, through the privatisation contracts. But secondly, they want to save money. They want to cut public expenditure. Right? And supposing the National Health Service budget in England was cut by £10 billion, then Scotland, under the Barnard formula, would suffer a cut of approximately £1 billion. That's the knock-on effect. Now, it is true, in theory, uh, that John Swinney, or whoever happens to be the Finance Minister in Scotland, uh, can say, oh, I'm going to protect the NHS budget. I'm not going to have any cuts in the NHS budget. What does he have to do? He's got to look around the other parts of that budget in order to save money. So he's got to look around, for example, is he going to cut health? Is he going to cut the social services for the elderly? Is he going to cut the housing budget? I mean, that is the limit of his powers because at present, the powers that are vested within the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government are very, very limited indeed. And I believe that if we had the full powers, the full economic powers, the whole range of economic levers at our disposal, then we'd be able to do uh, so much more. Uh, and there are other areas too, apart from economic matters, which are uh, at present reserved, entirely reserved uh, to, to Westminster, like defence and foreign affairs. Well, if we had powers over defence and foreign affairs, we, in an independent Scotland, we would be able to decide whether or not we want to get involved in illegal and immoral warfare in Iraq or anywhere else. And we would be able to decide whether we want to continue spending billions of pounds on Trident and other weapons of mass destruction. And if we in the Scottish Parliament had the purse to regulate the financial institutions, would be able to stop the bankers uh, filling their pockets with big fat bonuses while bringing the country to the brink of economic disaster. And if we had powers over tax, all the powers over tax and national insurance, we'd be able to introduce a fair progressive system of taxation whereby the, the rich pay a bit more, the poor pay a bit less, and the very poor shouldn't be paying any tax at all. system of benefits, uh, including the complete abolition of the bedroom tax, which, uh, let's face it, it would never have seen the light of day in an independent uh, in Scotland. So I see independence not as an end in itself. I see it as a means towards building a better Scotland, a more prosperous Scotland, a fairer Scotland, uh, and indeed a Scotland that will uh, play its full part in the international community. Uh, because uh, I'm not a nationalist. I mean, Gordon's uh, not a, a nationalist uh, uh, either. Uh, I think that both of us would probably prefer to be described as internationalists. As the old Scots say, we're all John Thompson's parents. Some people might translate that as we're all God's children. Whether you believe in God or otherwise, we're certainly all members of the human race. We're all citizens of the world. Uh, and I have always believed, um, as a socialist and an internationalist, I have always believed in the principle of international solidarity. And I am appalled again when I see the foreign affairs agenda uh, emanating uh, from uh, Westminster. Increasingly anti-European, uh, xenophobic, at times racist. We've now got the UK tail wagging the Tory dog to such an extent that if their 
the referendum uh, does take place in a couple of years' time, uh, and we don't vote yes uh, for a, an independent Scotland, we could find ourselves expelled uh, from Europe uh, on the strength uh, of UKIP and Tory votes uh, south of the border. Well, I don't want to live in that uh, kind of uh, country, in that kind of world. I would like to see an independent Scotland pursuing an ethical foreign policy and an immigration policy, a fair immigration policy which is based on the equality of human beings, irrespective of the colour of their skin, their ethnicity, their faith, their country of origin, eh, or whatever. So, in conclusion, may I just say this? Um, I chair the Yes Scotland campaign, which, as I said previously, is a broad, inclusive campaign consisting of representatives and people from different political parties and people like myself who are not members of any political party at all. Uh, some people are less, that were just a front for the SNP, uh, but that's a misapprehension, uh, although some people seem to labour labour under that misapprehension. <laughs> <laughs> I, recently, I recently came across a lady uh, who's a constituent of mine and, and a long-time supporter of mine. She, like myself, she was Labour born and bred, uh, but when I stood as an independent candidate for the Scottish Parliament, she voted for me, but when I asked her to vote yes in the referendum, she said, oh, no, I'm a Dennis. Look, son, this is a step too far. <laughs> this is a step too far, son. You can't really expect me to vote for that man, Simon. You can't really be asking me to vote for the SAP. My father would kill me. I said, well, Johnny, for a start, your father has been deep for the last 20 years. So there's no fear on that score. And also, I'm not asking you to vote for any particular politician in this referendum. And I'm not asking you to vote for any particular political party in this referendum. This is an issue which transcends party politics. This is an issue about your future, your children's future, and your grandchildren's future. Another question which I'm often asked is, <coughs> can we win? Well, a couple of years ago when this campaign was first launched, uh, I think the opposition were over 20 points ahead and all the posters and pundits would say, no chance. And there were some people on the no side saying, why don't you need to bother fighting a campaign? These people on the yes side are absolutely useless. They don't know how to run a campaign, etc., etc. Uh, well, the gap is beginning to close now. And uh, I remember in these early days, I always said that this campaign is more uh, like a, a marathon than a short sprint. And having run more than a few marathons in my time, I know that sometimes there can be a guy in, in front of you for most of the race, maybe, maybe even right up to the final stages of the race. But if you show that you've got the guts, the stamina, the determination, you can overtake that guy uh, before the, the finishing date. And that's what we are doing now. We are closing the gap and we are going to win the race. Uh, I am quite convinced that we've got the the foot soldiers who are capable of doing this. I know that sometimes people get despondent when the other side uh, get more publicity than us, particularly in, in, the, in the print media. Uh, but may I say this, that this, this campaign is not simply going to be won on TV studios or radio studios or the column inches of newspapers. This campaign is going to be fought in the streets and in the communities and in the homes of Scotland. And uh, over the next two weeks, you are going to see the most successful grassroots community-based campaign that Scotland has ever seen. And we are going to take our message out and win the hearts and minds of the people of Scotland by taking that message out into every street, every home, every community, every city, every town, every hamlet, every workplace in Scotland. And a simple message is this, that it's only by voting yes in this referendum that the people of Scotland are going to be empowered, empowered to elect their own government accountable to the people of Scotland and that will lead to a better Scotland, a more prosperous Scotland 
but above all a fair Scotland and a Scotland that will play its full part in the international community to help to build a better world. That is our message and when we get that message across to the people of Scotland we are going to win a famous and historic victory. So I say to the people of Barkey and the rest of West Lothian, let's go for it!
aren't you abandoning the working class and the rest of the country by supporting independence in Scotland? And the categorical answer is, no, of course not. In fact, a vote for independence in Scotland, as far as the Yes campaign, it's a rejection of neoliberalism, it's a rejection of warmongering, it's a rejection of the politics of Westminster, and it's the application of our social democratic and socialist centre of gravity in Scotland. That's what this debate is about. That's the clear demarcation lines here. And I'm absolutely clear. Karl Marx talks about workers as world unite. Actually, I think Karl Marx is maybe paraphrasing Joe Thompson, because it's the same thing. It's the same idea that workers of the world should stand in solidarity with one another. And I make it clear, I'm no uh, problem. I lived in East End of London for 10 years. My in-laws up in Sheffield. There's a working class Scot. I've got more in common with working class people in England and Wales than I've got with the Duke of Buclew, the Duke of Oxford, or the rich, maybe even Brian Sewer, people like that. No question about it. I understand what class politics is. But I also understand that solidarity doesn't finish at the English Channel. I've got more in common with working class people in Beijing, in Argentina, in Russia, in the Fijis, in the Philippines. Working class people have got one very important thing in common, Tony, as you know, and that is that we sell our labour on an hourly basis to keep our family together and to pay our, our, our bills. That's what working class people's experience is. But what I've heard the debate in the context of Britain, we say, you're abandoning the working class in East End of London, you're abandoning the working class in Liverpool and Newcastle and Sheffield and the rest of it. And on the contrary, Scotland and Scotland's working class are leading the struggle for these values in Britain. And not for the first time. Scotland, as you know, gave the world the short Stewards movement. Scotland led the UCS battle in 1971. Scotland, in the context of Britain, led the anti folk tax campaign in the 1980s. Because the working class struggle in these aisles does not proceed uniformly. And in Scotland, working class people are at the forefront of a kicking of neoliberalism, of a rejection of warmongering, and acting as a beacon to the rest of the working class in Britain and throughout the world. And I'm bound to say, I know I'm with Marx and Lenin and others, who made it clear, of course, one difference between the working class people in Newcastle and Liverpool and Leeds and Sheffield that I mentioned, Bristol, London, if Newcastle is not a country, Liverpool is not a country, London is not a country, Scotland is a country, we have rights as a nation, we have the right, the Marx and Lenin and others talked about, the right to self-determination, and we choose to exercise it. And I think that's why you'll find that the overwhelming majority of socialists in Scotland are supporting independence and are back in a yes case. And can I say this to Billy in housing? Billy's coming. challenged and opposed those councils, Labour councils in Scotland that sought to privatise our council housing stock in Edinburgh. There was a ballot of all the tenants in Edinburgh for or against the privatisation of the council's housing stock. And the Scottish Socialist Party was very much at the forefront of opposing that privatisation led by the Labour Council at the time. And I remember saying, we are not in favour of privatising council housing stock. We want to see council houses being built. There are 152,000 people, 152,000 people in Scotland today on housing waiting lists for a council house. You know, I've shared the platform as a woman called Michelle Thompson for Business for Scotland. And Tony would understand it's not a common sight to the Scottish Socialist Party in Business for Scotland on the same platform. But Michelle tells this story about when she was in Millport, which is the Isle of Cumbria off large, as a wee girl. And there's a wishing well there, my dad threw a penny down the wishing well. And she's eight and she's got a sister and a brother. And she says, Dad, what did you wish for? And he says, I wish that when we moved back to Glasgow we would have a council house. That was his aspiration, a council house in the 1940s and 50s. And I, I mentioned with Lorraine, because when I was in the Scottish Parliament, the campaign for council housing, Dennis and I, and the progressives that were there, and I was delighted that Midlothian Council invited me out to Woodburn and Dalkeith to hand over the keys to a woman and her three kids, the first of a thousand new council houses being built in Midlothian. And let me say, in, in fairness, it was a Labour council. And that one council, Midlothian, one of the smallest, and with all due respect, relatively speaking, one of the poorest local authorities in Scotland, had built a thousand council houses 
which was more than the other 31 for the year. And I applauded them when they're doing the right thing, that's a good thing. Now, I, I, the first they accept a thousand council houses in Midlothian, that still leaves a lot to go. Well, how can Midlothian build a thousand council houses and Edinburgh can't build a single one? Why can Glasgow not build a single one but they sell off their council housing stock to the GHA? In this campaign, we're going to build council houses, we're going to build affordable housing for people in Scotland because it's a disgrace that in Britain today, including Scotland, we pay a third of our disposable income on average on our housing costs because of a mortgage. You're choked by debt and a mortgage that you can barely afford paying far too much of your money for housing. That's got to change. Housing is a right, it's not a privilege and it's a need that must be addressed. And if I can say finally to Alan, you know, every time the question that he raises about I went to Strathclyde University, I got a grant, I worked for the post office in the term between times, I you know, got my degree, I went to Bell College, etc. And the words that string in my year, John McLean, the leader of Ed Clyde side a hundred years ago, made a very important point. He was a teacher like Dennis was. And he understood that he said education is a right for human beings, not a privilege. It's your right. Working class people must strive to access education. prevent us from getting learning, understanding Karl Marx and Lenin and John McLean and Rosa Luxemburg and Rosa Parks. There's an absolute world that we have to learn as working class people. The rich teach us nothing. They deprive us of an education and we have to fight that. <clears throat> Uh, uh, 
uh, where they do uh, share their ideas and discuss how they can use their uh, collective power uh, in the global uh, economic uh, situation. But there's a basic democratic argument too about the whole this business about the advance of socialism. To get an advance in socialism, <laughs> you surely do not have to wait until the rest of the world agrees before you make some kind of socialist advance. That sometimes one particular country, even a wee country, can have a good idea and advance that idea. You might call it a, a so socialist idea or a progressive idea or what. And I maintain that no other country, especially a big neighbouring country, should have the democratic veto on the advancement of one smaller nation. And we have already shown uh, through the devolved settlement how we have chosen a different path in many things like the National Health Service and, and uh, education and care of the elderly, land reform is another thing. These are all what I would call significant social or socialist uh, advances that we were able to implement under the Westminster system, we would never have been able to do that because Westminster never had the time or the inclination to pass the necessary uh, legislation. And I maintain that if we had full legislative powers and a full range of economic uh, levers, then we'd be able to, to do uh, so much more. And people in England, the working class in England, would say, hey, the Scots are doing it this way, so why can't we? do something that the Scots uh, are doing, if they can do it better than us, uh, is sometimes referred to as the beacon uh, effect, uh, whereby, and I, I think it was reflected recently at a question of time, I think it was in Liverpool, uh, and it was uh, Alex Salmon, I, mean, I don't think Alex Salmon would describe himself as a, a, a socialist, but he, he was talking about things like uh, free higher education and a free national health service and so on. And a lot of the other puddling working class were saying, hey, this is great. We, we didn't realise that. We're wanting that too. And that could create momentum uh, south of the border. Uh, so I, I don't see ourselves uh, as being uh, completely separated from our working class friends uh, south of the border. Uh, I think that uh, uh, what I am arguing for is the political freedom on the part of the people of Scotland to choose a different path if that is what they want. Uh, and of course we can still uh, retain uh, uh, links uh, with our friends south of the border, but it would be a partnership of equals rather than at present. It's a partnership of uh, unequals where the the uh, superior, the country that's superior in numbers has in effect a right of veto. Very briefly on the uh, higher education and, and housing thing, I, I think that uh, Colin dealt with these uh, matters very well indeed. Uh, you could argue, of course, that under the existing settlement, the Scottish Parliament already has these powers. Uh, but as I explained, that the, the powers are limited. You're in a kind of financial straitjacket. You can't spend as much on housing or as much on education uh, as you would like because you don't have the financial levers uh, at your uh, disposal. Uh, all that the Minister, uh, the Finance Minister for the, in Scotland can do is carve up the cake so much for education, so much for the National Health Service, so much for housing. He's got no power really to increase the size of the cake and then carve it out uh, differently. So uh, I would expect uh, uh, that in independent uh, uh, Scotland we would see further improvements uh, in uh, education including higher education uh, and also uh, uh, more uh, choice in people's uh, uh, tenure of housing because I don't think uh, there's, a, there's enough in the way of affordable housing uh, either through council housing or through housing associations at present.
stop its working fast. We cannot take that away from the, the 200 years in which the Scottish working class united with the rest of the British working class in monumental struggles, beginning with the, the formation of the Charter Spring, the 1926 General Strike, the strikes that brought down Ted Heath's notorious Tory Monday, and many, many others. And what's happening here if Scotland goes independent? What you're saying to the British working class, it will not be a people. That's a nonsense, an absolute charade. Because what will happen is the working class in Britain, in Liverpool, Manchester and Yorkshire will be left to fight on their own against the notorious Tory government, a right-wing vicious Labour Party and the rest of the hangers on. This is not some sort of socialist event that's going on here. What's going on here is a so-called socialist party climbing into bed with capitalists. Something that the history of Scotland, a Scottish minister, something that the history of Scottish working class would abhor, would be horrified to know that the, the, the people that came after it and allowing these people What's the question? What's the question? That is the question. What's the question? That is the question. That is the question. I'm telling you what's going on. Do you have any other questions from the floor? Because we do want to hear from the floor. people are going to stand up against the Tories and fight them when they do it. paper um, tells us um, SNP's plan for an independent Scotland. Should we not be getting another referendum after we win yes um, on a currency union on the Queen, um, whether we stay in Europe? <laughs> <laughs> and a 
slight, a slightly more frivolous question is, um, Alistair Carmichael's came out and offered him these services after we win an independence that he's going to join Team Scotland to, to negotiate for us. Who uh, has? Alistair Carmichael. But given he's, he's talked us down for two years, I mean, is that, is that the quality of people that we actually want to talk on our side to negotiate good questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And George Osborne flew into 
uh, Edinburgh called February this year, remember it? I think it was the 13th, remember it, be the day before Valentine's Day. Because I remember getting all the cards. <laughs> anyway, we were in Edinburgh at 8 o'clock in the morning. We did a meeting at the Point Hotel at 9 o'clock. And by 10 o'clock he was back in the plane back down to London. And he said, you can't use the currency. It's our currency. And George Osborne, public school boy, comes up to Scotland and tells us what we can and can't do. Well, we weren't born yesterday. We've got some self-respect, as Dennis said. And we don't get told what to do by public school boys who don't know what they're talking about. And it's an empty threat because they can't stop us using the pound. It's our currency as much as his, they can't stop us. And the Scottish Socialist Party, Dennis, Jim Sellers, Elaine C. Smith, many people in the yes side have made it clear we're in favour of having the same pound sterling for that period of the negotiations in the 16 months between next Thursday and the, six, the 2016 elections. But in the course of those negotiations, it becomes clear that we would be better off with our own Scots pound. We have control of our own interest rates, our own budgets. We have control, as independence allows us. Then we reserve the right to have our own currency if that suits us best. The key thing here, of course, is each of these are our decisions. No theirs, no anybody else's. And we'll take the decision that's best suited to Scotland. And if I can say this to you, Paul, Joseph Steiglitz, the Nobel, Peace, Nobel Prize winning economist, has said, in circumstances where Scotland is independent, and you're in this transitional arrangement, you may well find that it's in Scotland's best interest to have our own currency, because an independent Scotland with 95% of the oil and gas reserves is likely to have a large trade surplus. In other words, we'll be selling much more to the world than we import, Whereas Britain, which has got colossal debts, would continue to have a massive trade deficit. And in those circumstances, think what it does to the Scotch whisky industry, or to the smoked salmon, or Aberdeen Angus, anything we export, you're going to find that the price of that internationally is colossal. We can't sell them because it's linked to the pound. And it might well be in Scotland's interest to break with parity of the pound and say, okay, from now on, you need three English pounds to buy a Scottish pound because that's who sell best, that's what our economy needs and we deserve the right to do it. And I think that's the right way forward. On John's question, let me say this in finishing, because uh, I'm going to leave Nathan's question to Dennis, if you don't mind, uh, Nathan, because I know Dennis has got a really good answer and I don't want to steal it. But I do want to say this to John. Another referendum, I'm in favour, and, and there's a, a very good friend of the independence movement here from Norway tonight, Cecil, I met her yesterday and she asked me about this question of the republic, when will Scotland be a republic, and I said, you know, we're going to vote for independence in two weeks' time, yes, for independence, and then we're going to have another debate in Scotland about the type of head of state, the type of democracy that we want to have, and I'm comfortable and I welcome that today because my feeling is this has unleashed a certain desire in the people of Scotland for more devolution, more devolved power to local communities like yours, more democracy, go on, give us it, we can handle it, we can handle it, give us it, tell you what, we live our own head of state, we live our own president, we live a debate, and whether we decide to have a referendum on what kind of head of state we have, whether we have a referendum on a republic, well that's up to us to decide, and as a socialist who supports a republic and a democrat, I wait the decision of the people of Scotland, and I'll respect it. I look forward to having that debate on a republic, quite frankly, because I think A, I wrote the pamphlet, and then sales of it will, you know, they'll be on a par with Harry Potter. The second way, we'll have a proper debate in this, because the debate presently is laughable. It really is laughable. The defence of the monarchy in this country is like something you read in the Beano or the Dandy or this. Anyway, I look forward to having that debate on currency, devolution, and future. And you know, it's like said at the very beginning of Mara Marx, there's been an unleashing of energy, excitement, participation in Scotland with this debate that's never going to change. Take a look around you. Scotland has changed forever. The Scotland that you once know is gone forever. The new, vibrant, democratic, healthy, participatory country that we always dreamed we'd have, we're building it. After the 18th of September, we'll have a country that is new, fresh, democratic and up for anything that's put in front of us.
that, that, that Scotland can uh, show an example uh, to uh, many working class women in the south of the border. And of course, we, we can learn all, uh, lessons uh, from them too. You know, you, you mentioned the, the Chartist movement and the, the, the uh, lessons of the, the general strike uh, and so on. And there are lots of examples of international movements too, which transcend boundaries. The fact that a country is independent doesn't mean that you're cutting yourself off from all the other countries in the world, far from it. I mean, think of the, the anti-apartheid movement. It was an international campaign amongst many independent nations which brought success. And similarly, although we want to get rid of uh, Trident uh, from Scottish soil, Scottish territorial waters, we want to continue the international peace uh, movement through many uh, uh, countries, many of them small independent uh, countries that want to see the removal of nuclear weapons, not just from their own uh, environments, but from uh, the, the whole world. Uh, now, further devolution was mentioned. Yes, I'm all in favour of further devolution within Scotland. I mean, we're talking here not about more powers for a devolved parliament. I mean, that's uh, uh, a, a, poor, a, a very, very, very poor second best to uh, independence, but within an independent Scotland, the, the devolving of more power uh, to communities is uh, very important, I think. And uh, uh, even the present Scottish government, in its white paper, has indicated that the written constitution uh, will have uh, defined powers for uh, local authorities. Uh, at present, uh, all the local authorities in Scotland are creatures either of the Scottish Parliament or indeed uh, of the Westminster. Uh, uh, parliament. You know, the, the, the powers were laid out uh, by parliamentary statute at uh, uh, the last time at uh, Westminster. So there have been a few changes since the Scottish Parliament came into existence. But by and large, local authorities do not have any autonomy at all uh, in Scotland. And uh, I do think that that is wrong. Uh, and I would go even further and say that community councils uh, should have uh, devolved powers to. Uh, and I think the question I mentioned, the possibility of city status, uh, well, I, I certainly uh, would give positive consideration to that, but it would have to be worked out. Um, and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be in favour of one guy, the mayor, being a kind of leader of a cabinet, the look of Boris. For <laughs> 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 example. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in principle, uh, more devolution within Scotland. Uh, here, here. Uh, uh, on uh, finance, there was a suggestion that uh, companies might tend to move to low wage uh, economies and therefore causing uh, unemployment in Scotland. In actual fact, what's happening now with, with uh, even enlightened capitalist employers, that many of them uh, are, are most successful and most competitive and most efficient in high wage economies. And unfortunately, uh, in Scotland, we've got a fairly low wage e economy, but we had a, a, a decent living wage, and the trade unions were given more powers to negotiate uh, to improve the wages and conditions, uh, then uh, I think we'd do better in an independent Scotland, rather to see that, uh, instead of seeing a mass exodus uh, of uh, employers. Um, Paul is the question of the uh, Iraq war. Uh, well, as I said in my previous comments, uh, if, if foreign affairs and defence are the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament, I, I don't think we would have got dragged into that uh, Iraq war. I mean, that, that was absolute disgrace. I mean, how, how a Labour Prime Minister, I mean, how Blair could allow himself to be, to be sucked in by a low calibre American president. Bush was a very intellectual, charismatic figure. Like that, according to the great world plan. I mean, I, I, mean, I just, it beggars belief, you know, that, 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 that Blair could reduce himself and the UK foreign policy to be a mere fool of the uh, United States. And I can't see that happening uh, in Scotland. I think that's part of the reason, too, why. The American powers that be and Lord Georgie Boy Robertson and all the rest of them, he's another poodle of America. <laughs>
It has been since it was a student at Dundee University yeah, yeah. back in the, the 1960s. I mean, I know where all the bodies are buried, you know. Where was this one? Cataclysmic. That's right. Cataclysmic consequences on the geopolitical scene. You know, the possibility of the yes vote. <laughs> Uh, an independent Scottish pound uh, was raised as well. Yes, I, I, uh, I, I support that uh, in principle, but I'm realistic enough to know. I mean, I don't think my own personal views are of paramount importance. I mean, whatever you think of Alex Salmon, he did, he and his party won that uh, um, mandate uh, at the, you know, the last Scottish Parliament elections. They, they brought an overall majority of seats in the Scottish Parliament, which was almost uh, undreamt of, you know, the, uh, everybody was astounded, I think he saw himself, but anyway, he got, he got the mandate and uh, I suppose he's got the right to, to lead uh, the negotiations, uh, so I accept uh, that, that uh, uh, he will start off with that, his preferred option of currency, uh, even though it might not be the preferred option of everybody on this platform or everybody uh, in this uh, room. And what may emerge, you know, there might be another option like an independent Scots pound, and uh, I would be very happy uh, with that. I think I will, uh, probably Colin would be, would be too. Uh, John said something about the White Paper is the SNP plan, but what about other referenda on things like the, the, the monarchy, the currency, the European Union? I don't want to end up having a referendum every weekend on every single subject. It's on matters of big constitutional importance. I, I think that there is a strong case uh, to hold uh, a, a referendum. And I hope that within the written constitution, uh, the, I think the written constitution should be put not just to Parliament, but also to the, the people as a whole uh, in that uh, referendum, uh, by, by referendum, and that uh, the people should also have the opportunity uh, to bring about amendments uh, to, the, to the Constitution and that any amendment to the Constitution should also be by way uh, of uh, referendum. Membership of Team Scotland, well, uh, Alex Thurman has indicated that he, he would be agreeable to have Alistair Darling and Gordon Brown in Team Scotland. Well, I think we should have called him Fox. So <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, these guys are going to be on the losing side. But no, no much to argue by way of a democratic mandate. I don't mind if they're considered to be elder states persons and all that. I don't mind them being consulted in a polite manner. Uh, but I don't want them to have no decision making power. Uh, and certainly not a, uh, anything like a, a, a veto. Uh, and then uh, Nathan on a day to remember, uh, shortly before I retired, Nathan, I successfully introduced a bill to make St Andrew's Day a national holiday in Scotland. Uh, unfortunately, it's not universally recognised. It is, it is actually a bank holiday in Scotland, but all that a bank holiday does is that it gives you uh, the power to postpone a banking transaction on that day without incurring any penalty. And that was traditionally the way in which employers therefore said, ah, right, no penalties if they delay a transaction until the Tuesday or whatever, therefore we'll give the workers a whole other money. Exactly the same legislation that, 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 that Howard Wilson used uh, to make May Day uh, a, a holiday, uh, a bank holiday. Um, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, employers in Scotland just ignore it. So maybe I, 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 I had a, a campaign committee consisting of even people from a unionist tradition who were, who were campaigning hard to get broader recognition uh, of the holiday. But we agreed uh, amongst ourselves just to suspend it during the referendum campaign. But it will, I'll ho hopefully get that campaign committee uh, restarted sometime after the 18th of September. Uh, and uh, if people aren't happy with uh, uh, St Andrew's Day being the sole national holiday, then why not have another one on the 18th of September annually, <laughs> uh, or the annual uh, anniversary of, of the Declaration of Armed Roads in 1520, uh, or Burns Day, or all of them. <laughs> Thanks very much to Colin and Dennis for
ever so ably responding to those questions. Um, I've just had, um, I'd just like to bring the attention of everybody. Um, another meeting that's coming up in the next couple of weeks, Tuesday the 9th of September, to be held at Armadale Academy. And this is um, for the undecided how to vote in the referendum. Colin's going to be speaking at that meeting alongside Fiona Hislop and a number of other speakers. That's 6.30 until 8.30, Armadale Academy, Tuesday the 9th of September. And something else to come along to. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that um, if anyone's interested in joining the Scottish Socialist Party, please come over to the side, leave your name and, and details, um, have a look at the badges and pamphlets and um, SSP voices that we have for sale over at the side. Um, and I think that all that remains really is for me to make a couple of thanks. I'd like to say that... Can I ask one other question? It's just come up with something that Dennis was saying. Um, just remembered about it. My name's Barry, um, and it's on Team Scotland. And I think this is a proposal that came out from the Jimmy Reid Foundation. Um, but it might have been um, Commonwealth National Collective. I think it was Jimmy Reid, and it's the Citizens Council for Scotland. Um, and basically their proposal is to take it out of the hands of Team Scotland, because at the minute all we're doing is taking it from the power of the elite in Westminster and putting it in the elite in Scotland. And the general working class, the people of Scotland, aren't going to have a voice in this on which powers to be negotiated and how it's going to be done. And the idea of the Citizens Council for Scotland is following the Iceland model, where, as of the general public, put our names forward into a pot. Um, it's online at the minute, I think, under Citizens Council for Scotland, and basically they draw from the general populace after the referendum's over in the event of a yes or no, and we turn around and say, no, this is the powers we want for Devo Max, or this is the powers that we want. We want our own currency, or we want shared currency with the pound, etc. I don't know what the panel thinks of that idea or not, but personally, I've signed up for it, but online, there's only about 800 signatures, and I don't think it's getting the coverage it deserves, because it's all on Team Scotland. Mm -hmm. well, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm in favour of Team Scotland that includes Gary Lineker, Bobby Moore, Bobby Charon and Jimmy Hill. That's important, I think, for Team Scotland. What you're driving at is we'll pick Team Scotland, but do you know what's wrong with that idea? Instinctively, I agree with it. But what you're asking is full-time negotiators sitting down with the British ruling class who are as fly as a barload of monkeys. They'll take a levy anybody who isn't watching this. Look at India, look at Ireland, look around the world. These people have been here before and they'll shaft us unless we send the most committed, determined, clever people to defend what this referendum is all about. Thank you for that last and final question. Thank you. Um, Thank you.